I now invite Chief Justice Mortimer to deliver the 2023 Richard Larkins Oration. Thank you. Your Excellency, the Chancellor, the Interim President and Vice-Chancellor, Emeritus Professor Richard Larkins, Mrs Caroline Larkins, and may I make special mention of the Honourable Peg Lusink, AM, a very special honour for me to have you here tonight. I know there are many other distinguished guests, many have been mentioned. I thank you all, as I thank everyone in this room, for doing me the honour of coming tonight. I'm especially proud to be invited to speak at a Monash University event, the university from which I graduated, and if you will permit me a proud mother moment, the university from which my daughter graduated with a PhD in cosmology. Yes, I'll give her a round of applause. We are on the traditional country of the people of the Kulin Nation. And the area where this building is located is generally recognised as the country of the people of the Eastern Kulin Nation, whose traditional lands extend around Port Phillip and Western Port and up to the Great Dividing Range and the valleys of the Loddon and Goulburn Rivers. This area of Melbourne was once a traditional gathering place for their clans as well as a living area. I offer my respects to the people of the Eastern Kulin Nation, to their ancestors and to their elders. I'm especially privileged to see Professor Auntie Eleanor Burke here tonight. Thank you for coming, you do me a great honour. I acknowledge the challenges facing the Australian community in our relationship with First Nations peoples including how First Nations peoples are treated by the justice system. Indeed, I want to talk to you tonight about justice, why it matters to the very centre of existence as a community in this country, that each and every person in this country is asked to engage more than superficially about justice, to decide what it means to them and what they conceive it to involve. That is why I want to start by taking you back to an initiative of the Federal Court of Australia in 2001, being the genesis of the title of my presentation tonight. That initiative is an example of what a court like the Federal Court can do to encourage talking, thinking and action about justice. The project was called The Art of Delivering Justice. In 2001, the Commonwealth of Australia marked 100 years since Federation. A National Council for the Centenary of Federation was established to develop and coordinate events and activities to mark the centenary and promote awareness of Australian history and civics. The National Council allocated $9 million of grants for the production of scholarly and popular materials to educate Australians about Federation. In its own contribution to the centenary activities, the Federal Court wanted to promote student understanding and awareness about the Federal Court's place in the justice system and therefore in the functioning of Australian democracy. The Court partnered with the then Curriculum Development Body to develop a program for Australian lower and middle secondary school students. The Art of Delivering Justice project was managed by the court's then Director of Community Relations and overseen by an advisory committee consisting of judges, senior staff of the court, members of the Victorian Curriculum Assessment Authority and La Trobe University. The project produced a detailed curriculum resource book and a 20 minute video designed to place the study of law and justice in a human context, including footage from native title and human rights trials and interviews with the then Chief Justice of the Federal Court, uh, uh, Michael Black. The project book commenced with material designed to help students understand the role of courts in a representative democracy, the different roles played by different courts in Australia, and how our federal system affects what different courts do. There were two trials used as case studies from key areas of the court's jurisdiction. First, 
the claim brought by the Mirrawong and Gudgerong people in Western Australia to have their native title to their traditional country recognised in relation to areas around Lake Argyle, the Ord River and the town of Karanana, Kar Karanara. The second case study was a disability discrimination case about a young girl with spina bifida who was not permitted to attend an independent school because the school felt they didn't have the physical infrastructure to, to accommodate her. The curriculum book, video, poster were sent to every single secondary school in Australia. At that time, about two and a half thousand schools. The project took real cases from the federal court, which threw up challenging and conflicting moral, political and legal issues. They were cases where there were legitimate arguments to be made on both sides of the courtroom. The project invited students to learn about issues through role play reenactments, through discussion and through art. It invited students and their teachers to travel deeper into some of the complexities these cases threw up. Deeper into what justice meant to those who sought it in those cases, to those who opposed the claims, and to the wider community looking from outside, and deeper into what those issues said about the court's role in the justice system. In the disability discrimination case study, students were asked to grapple with competing human rights and how they could be resolved fairly, the rights of students, both disabled and able-bodied, the teachers, the fee-paying parents, the school and its board. In the native title case study, students analysed key principles of justice and the rule of law and explored how the court put each of those principles into practice in the native title claim process. They had to grapple with the balance of competing arguments and interests in land on the part of the Mirawong Gudgerong peoples, their tradition, language and custom on the side of the pastoralists, the mining companies and government with considerations of economy, safety and tourism. A unique feature of the Federal Courts project was a one-off National Centenary of Federation arts competition run for students. The competition winner was a student from Thailand who was a boarder at one of Melbourne's private schools. His painting was a large canvas depicting the plight of people on the Tampa and displaying the role of the Federal Court in that hearing. Other entries included a tapestry entitled The Justice Collage and another entry was entitled Terra Nullius. This project was about more than the justice system, although the justice system was the jumping off point for what students were asked to think about and then reflect on. The project asked students to look at how the values and tensions which are at play in deciding how to do justice and how to deliver justice. Yes, it asked teachers and students to venture into controversial areas. But it is in those controversial areas that it matters most for individuals to form an understanding of what we think justice is and what should be done to achieve it. I don't pretend that the present Australian school curriculum is without content about democracy, parliament, the constitution and the courts. And I know that many courts in this state are active in allowing school, st school students to visit the courts and observe proceedings. However, I do have a sense of pessimism about present levels of engagement with justice as a fundamental value for our society. And the two recent examples I'm going to speak about illustrate my concern. How could deeper school education, as well as deeper community education and discussion about the concept of justice make a difference. The two examples I take are the voice referendum and the decision of the High Court last week that Australian law does not permit a person without a visa to be deprived of their liberty indefinitely. There are many other examples of where contemporary Australian society is in desperate need of deeper and better education about justice and how to achieve it, but it would be a very long speech if I went through them all. I'll start with the voice referendum. In the native title work undertaken by the Federal Court of Australia and uniquely to our court, evidence is given by First Nations peoples 
about the nature and content of their traditional law and custom and how it connects them to their country and has done so since before time, to use a phrase common in the Torres Strait. As judges doing that work, we become accustomed to learning and speaking about Aranda law, Kulkagal law, Kaurig law, Gija law, Gunditjamara law, Ghana law, Yegel law, Kwandamuka law. We hear evidence about the existence of law and custom, particular to land holding groups, and its normative force over land, boundaries, uses of country, family relationships, behaviour, birth and death rituals. We see that law in action. In orders made by our court, called Determinations of Native Title, we recognise that particular law and custom has always provided First Nations peoples with title to their land and waters. We make those orders often because of agreements reached between the groups concerned in government and other landholders, or sometimes after contested trials. Either way, the traditional law and custom of each group is real and tangible and alive. Notwithstanding that an Australian court under Australian law has been recognising it for more than 30 years, it seems that many parts of the Australian community have difficulty accepting or perhaps understanding that First Nations law is real and it can give title to land and waters. What I observed during the, vo the process of the voice referendum, including directly from people I interacted in, was a real lack of understanding about that reality. Some years before the referendum, the late Mr G Unipingu, leader of the Gumich clan of the Yolnu people, described what was being asked of Australian people as a whole. I want to read you what he said. What Aboriginal people ask is that the modern world now makes the sacrifices necessary to give us a real future, to relax its grip on us, to let us breathe, to let us be free of the determined control exerted on us to make us like you. And you should take that step, take a step further and recognise us for who we are and not who you want us to be. Let us be who we are, Aboriginal people in a modern world, and be proud of us. Acknowledge that we have survived the worst that the past has thrown at us, and we are here with our songs, our ceremonies, our land, our language, and our people, our full identity. What a gift this is that we can give you if you choose to accept us in a meaningful way. While never purporting to be unanimous, the Uluru Statement from the Heart contained what First Nations peoples themselves identified as the way forward to a just society in Australia and to justice for them. The voice was identified as the first step in resetting and reframing the relationship between First Nations peoples, government and the Australian community as a whole the other two identified steps being treaty and truth-telling. The resetting and reframing was offered by First Nations people who supported the Uluru Statement as an opportunity to create a new kind of Australian nation. One commentator described it as building a deeper politics, which can also mean recapitulating what politics is. Rule is to be shared to nourish a political community seeking the common good, a parallel and different pole of authority. Now, perhaps that is precisely why some vo voters rejected the voice proposal. I don't comment on the merits of the proposal or the referendum outcome. But the question I ask tonight is, did the level of debate during the referendum process 
demonstrate that generations of Australians had been effectively equipped to vote with a full understanding of whether the voice was part of a just outcome for this nation as a whole and for First Nations people in particular, I suggest our community has not been well equipped to do that. What if the community forums we saw held around the country had been a feature of our civic life for years instead of for months? What if most Australians had a chance to sit with and engage with First Nations peoples as part of a normalised community experience rather than as a novelty or in the pressure cooker environment of a political contest? What if most Australians felt comfortable discussing our constitution and felt that they understood what its role was as well as understanding the High Court's role in interpreting it? If all those things had been normalised as part of living in our communities, might the debate we saw have been more respectful, more thoughtful, and less hurtful? Might Australians have had a deeper understanding of what was meant when the term justice for First Nations people was used in the discussions leading up to the referendum? Entrenching a new relationship between First Nations peoples and government in the Constitution was a cornerstone of the voice proposal, both its strength and its weakness. Why was it a weakness? because of the general absence of understanding in the Australian community about the role of a constitution in a representative democracy such as ours. An absence of understanding about why a constitution must be seen as both organic and susceptible to development and growth as the community it regulates grows and changes, and why it must be seen as enduring across generations an absence of understanding about the perfectly normal and central role always played by the High Court of Australia in interpreting the Constitution, rather than this being something new and radical to be feared. The content of the debate during the campaign amply demonstrates why in this country we need deeper and more intense levels of civics education not only in our primary and secondary schools. We need deeper and normalised discussion about civics and about the concept of justice across all sectors of our community. To say as much does not suggest at all that one particular lens should be applied. Quite the contrary, for as I've sought to emphasise by reference to how the Art of Delivering Justice project was structured that the Federal Court ran, each person needs to develop their own sense of what justice is. But in order to do so, they need to be well and regularly informed about the complexities of our history, our justice system, our structures of government, and the tensions that pull policy and government decision-making in different directions. That is an educative process that takes time, bipartisan commitment, and considerable financial and human resources. It is an educative process which must reach into every sector of our community, no matter how resistant or how challenging. Predominantly, it is a process that needs to happen at local and community levels, in environments where people feel comfortable to express different views, behave respectfully and talk their differences through. As a society, we seem to be losing the ability to engage in this way. That is why schools matter in this, but we can't leave everything to schools. Universities have a role to play too, so do councils, gatherings at town halls, community halls, places of worship, community centres. We witness the start of such engagement in the lead up to the referendum, and I applaud all those involved but there was too little, too late. What the recent referendum process proves, if we needed proof, 
is that consultation with the community and effective education about civics, about our basic constitutional structures and how they operate, is not the sole responsibility of the political branch. We must learn from this experience. Outside the school system, there are many points in the lives of our community where deeper, sustained, but objective civics education and discussion could be inserted to newly arrived visa holders, prior to the grant of citizenship, to people voting for the first time, as part of mainstream local council, state and federal election processes closer to home perhaps for this audience, perhaps civics engagement and discussion in a practical and hands-on way should be a compulsory part of every university student's first year. I suggest courts can contribute more actively, mindful not to come into conflict with our core functions. We administer justice according to Australian law and we have a role to play in helping each and every member of our community work out for themselves what they think justice looks like or should look like. Live streaming more hearings, online information that goes beyond court processes but remains objective, public forums directed not at lawyers but at community members, including by judges going out to community locations and more interaction with schools like the 2001 project did. In our native title work, for example, judges from our court already travel to many regional and remote locations and regional towns. When we are there, we could be taking more time out to speak to schools and communities about the matters that as a nation we currently treat rather superficially. Yes, it needs energy, enthusiasm, and above all, a commitment by all levels of government to fund such measures. If we don't take up this challenge, we travel further down a path to widespread intolerance and confrontation, as we see so tragically in our news every day. I want to move now from an example of justice broader than the legal system to an example of justice delivered by the legal system. This concerns the decision last week from the High Court of Australia, its first decision under its new Chief Justice and with a new seventh member of the court. The man who is the subject of this decision is of Rohingya ethnicity from Myanmar. He fled Myanmar as a teenager and sought asylum in Australia, arriving by boat without a visa and therefore being put into immigration detention. I pause here to remind you all that in Australia, we are so immunised to our system of mandatory detention that we forget Australia is an outlier in the international community in having such a system. The man was given a temporary visa and released from detention. Less than a year later, he was charged with a serious sexual offence against a child to which he pled guilty. In mid-2016, he was sentenced to five years imprisonment and his visa was cancelled. He served the non-parole period of his sentence and towards mid-2018, he was released on parole, having gone through the same parole processes as are applied to thousands of Australians in Australia's criminal justice system. However, on the same day he was granted parole by an independent parole board, because he did not have a valid visa, he was arrested and he was put back into immigration detention. And there he remained since 2018. What was to become of him? The Australian criminal justice system punished him for the crime he pled guilty to, and the parole authorities decided he was fit for release on parole, as they do for countless others. But since the Australian government would not give him another visa 
and allow him to stay here. He lost his liberty again, not for any defined period of time, like the five years he had been sentenced to for his crime, but indefinitely, unless and until the Australian government could find a country other than Myanmar which would take him. The Australian government accepted he could not be sent back to Myanmar because he had a well-founded fear of persecution as a person of Rohingya ethnicity. Indefinite detention had been found by a majority of the High Court in 2004 to be what Australian law required in a decision about a man called Mr El Khateb. Since 2004, hundreds of people have been locked up for lengthy periods of time, not because they have committed a crime, but because the Australian government was unable to find a country to send them to having decided they should not be allowed to stay here. Last week, almost 20 years later, after several decisions over the years refusing to change the decision in El Khateb, and with a different group of individuals now in the High Court, the High Court made orders releasing this man and thus finding in substance that the Australian Constitution did not authorise the indefinite detention of a person in his position. It seems more than 80 other detainees are affected by this decision. Was this person's crime for which he had been punished a reason that he should not now have his liberty? There has already been a lot of commentary to this effect. I accept this is a challenging decision for the community to grapple with, one that throws up questions about morality, community safety, citizenship, borders, the constitution and international law, all of which contribute to an understanding of the concept of justice. Yet in a truly civil society, we must move beyond the superficial and we must move beyond what grabs headlines. A justice-based discussion about this situation might better begin with us asking, as a community, do we care that a person from a persecuted minority in Myanmar who fled to Australia should be locked up indefinitely after he has served his sentence like every other offender? If, as a community, we don't care, why is this? Do we care more about the likely many dozens of people over the last 20 years who have never contravened Australian law but have been locked up under the El Khateb ruling? Or do we not care about them either? On both counts, I suggest at least one reason for an unsympathetic reaction from many sectors of the community is that understandings about justice and liberty are not well developed and are not valued in our civil discourse. The collective experiences in this country during COVID should have taught us more about why liberty is a fundamental value. The freedom to walk out of your house, to move about, to go to work, to go to school, Yet there has generally been a significant level of apathy or disinterest in the circumstances of people in immigration detention. I suggest we should be asking students and communities at a local level to engage throughout their lives with what justice means for the real life choices faced by groups such as asylum seekers and to engage more deeply about why liberty is such an important value. Judges understand that, but I wonder if many segments of the Australian community really do. Using the language of justice and balancing a set of more deeply developed considerations, we can equip the whole Australian community to have more balanced discussions than we are seeing at the moment. Using both school and university-based education, 
Using civic milestones, such as the granting of visas, granting of citizenship, eligibility to vote, the exercise of the franchise, we should be using those milestones as an opportunity to educate people that reach those milestones and help everyone develop a more nuanced and informed sense of justice across our community. Or at least, we should be trying. The challenge I give us all, and the challenge I set myself in my new role as Chief Justice by addressing you on this tonight, is to find tangible and effective ways to start talking more about justice and about the values that underlie it to our young people, to our neighbours, to those we disagree with, and for courts to play a more active role in helping that to occur. Thank you.